Hi, I'm Jeff Brown. And I'm Ross Bentley. And, and this, this is, is No No dumb questions. Dumb questions. Perfect. I think we nailed it. Perfect. All right. We're on. We're, we're on. Yeah. We're uh, pretty soon. Pretty soon. It's not going to matter. Or we should just do one with no intro and people will be like, oh, what happened? Uh, or they'll go, yay, none of that crap. Yay. <laughs> we don't have to hear about that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as usual, we've got a couple of good questions here. So we do. And I'm going to start. Let's just, we're just okay. jumping in. Uh, Greg, go. Greg asked a question. We both know Greg. Yeah. Uh, and Greg asked this question. Every year, advancing technology is allowing for growing instrumentation on race cars to the point where modern Formula One cars are generating literal ter terabytes of data per lap. What single quantifiable thing on or in a race car are we still unable to reliably or otherwise measure that would be most useful for finding performance? Hmm, interesting. So what single quantifiable thing on or in a race car are we still unable to reliably measure that would be most useful for finding performance? That sounds wow. very technical that, and very that is engineering a really good, focused. Good thing we have an engineer on this right. show. Well, <clears throat> Greg might be able to answer that better being a, a, a sim guy with his symmetric labs that he does yeah. all the simulation work. Yeah. But I would say oof, the problem that the thing that got me on that question is, is quantifiable thing what single quantifiable because now i'd like to measure some unquantifiable I'll, I'll diverge a little bit on that i'd like to be able to measure desire motivation yeah calmness clear thinking confidence 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 is a good one yep what else um the the uh, uh the, the 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 fear factor fear factor the and that can work both ways. Fear of losing and fear of winning. Yeah, yeah. Fear of not winning, I guess. Fear of, yeah. you know, fear of uh, I got to do good or uh, what happens if I don't do good. Um, so so what you're talking okay. about, there are a lot of, uh, we need a lot of sensors that would actually attach to a driver's body or head or something, right? Which, right, right. Uh, short of measuring heart rates and perspiration rates and some things like that uh, we're not quite there yet right no no what, the good thing is and, and to me that's what makes racing so cool is because we don't have to measure those but we as spectators can watch and see de desire motivation calmness clear thinking confidence you know we can kind of i don't know how you put a number to those but we can see that from drivers in certain situations and some that lack that and some that have more of that so, so uh, how many times, Jeff, have you been, you're in pit lane, your driver comes in, you kind of lean down into the cockpit and you look at the driver through the, through the visor or through the open port in, the, in his helmet and you look in there and you go, how's the car? And the driver gives you an answer and you can tell by looking at their eyes and how much of their face that you can see. And you can go, actually, that driver is just scared or right. that's, that driver has got like, is just how in the time of their life um, and you're going really, should I change something or do I really need to <laughs> change that part of it? So, yeah. I mean, that's, it, 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 we're really diverging here, but we'll get back to Greg's question, but that's <laughs> a great, a great point Ross is it back in the day, in the day, nineties, late mid to late nineties, we didn't have intercoms. And, you know, so, so most people, if they don't know, nowadays when the car comes into the pits, we don't want to talk on the radio to the driver and get his debrief and then me talk to the driver and tell him, oh, we should try it. What do you think about a different spring or a different wing angle or something like that? Because we all monitor our competitors' radio frequency. And so we all hear everything that the other team is saying. So we don't want to broadcast that over the over the radio so we have a a hardwired connection and you'll see it in indie car you'll see it in in sports cars where when a car comes in the pits during practice not during a race <clears throat> they'll plug a cable in sometimes two one's a data cable to suck the data out of the car and the other one's an intercom 
where you talk directly to the driver on a closed loop, just like a telephone line. It's a hard wire, basically. And so once we got the intercom, we lost that ability to see the driver and look into his eyes because the engineer's sitting in the stand, the driver's in the car. <clears throat> in the old days, I used to get off the stand. In IndyCar, I'd sit on the front wishbone and I'd look at the driver and we would talk because we didn't want to talk on the radio. And I could see that. I could see like his eyes. And, and I've, it's a little bit of a loss of that thing. You have to now hear it in his voice and know him well enough to like, this is really, really scary. Or this thing is way loose. Or man, it's loose, but I can deal with it. You know, those, you kind of have to get that or, nowadays. That or, or don't touch it. I love this car. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Yep. I've had that happen once, yeah, maybe twice. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but it's a it's a it's a real thing, and it's man, I, I don't know how to measure that other than we've tried a little bit back. I, I mean, Delara was leading that. Many people have heard my story about Delara with the with the steering torque sensor and all of that, trying to measure the driver's perceived limit of the car. And, and along with that whole thing, Delara, there was questionnaires that drivers would answer. And they asked them things like, how confident are you? How in the car? How confident are you that it won't spin out? How confident are you that, you know, we have this and that? So you could kind of measure those things qualitatively, I guess. Um, but quantitatively, like Greg asked, the one thing that comes up to me, because we can measure anything on the race car. I don't care, as he says, they make sensors for everything now. So you can measure yaw rate. You can measure vertical displacement. You can measure temperatures of anything, velocities, accelerations, RPM of anything. I mean, the GTP cars are using torque sensors in the rear axles to measure so IMSA can measure the actual power that the car is making to the rear axles. To me, if there was one thing I could measure, and it's it's not on the car, would be track grip. I'd like to be able to measure the incremental grip of the track around the track every one inch, one foot, whatever we could measure. I don't, you know, you, I don't know how you actually measure that. I know we've measured you know, Firestone, actually Marshall Pruitt did a really interesting little YouTube video on how Firestone measures track and grip. But that, you know, that's in certain circumstances. It's not during a race. It's not corner by corner, like when you're following somebody or, you know, as the rubber builds and stuff like that. I'd love to be able to measure track grip. Um, and I don't know, there's some attempts to do that, you know, with like wheel force transducers that try to measure the actual force in the wheel as it's turning at slip various slip angles, things like that. Um, those are really expensive sensors and I don't know. So there's my, my one for Greg would be Greg, figure out how to measure track and grip for me. So, so I was thinking you were going to say maybe something similar there and, and maybe what you just talked about is what is the answer. But I, I was going to say like, actual grip like tire grip at each tire at different places around the track and is that what you're talking about in terms of the the force uh, the Feel force, force thing sir? that you were talking about <clears throat> yeah 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 you use that technical yeah, term a, thingamajig yeah thingamajiggy yep yep yeah. that's th so those thingamajiggies are they actually go on the wheel hub and they stick out from the car and they measure the force that the tire is generating. Mm. Kind of like if people know about CalSpan, where you can take a tire and measure all the characteristics of that tire. They, as you turn a tire while it's going around a corner, the lateral force that it can produce changes based on slip angle. And the tire manufacturers will measure that because they want a tire that doesn't get to one slip angle as you're turning the wheel, one degree, two degree, a lot of grip, three degree, all of a sudden four degrees, no grip. And it just 
drops off because drivers don't like that. They like a, a kind of a progressive change in the grip level of the tire so that they can feel that edge. So tire manufacturers are really into that. And then it became a big thing. I remember Colin, when he was driving for Roush, went and went to every racetrack the year before they were going to start to clamp down on testing or maybe even ban it or very reduce it. So simulation became the only way to test. So he went to all of the NASCAR tracks and drove a car equipped with wheel force transducers to use that as a input to the simulate the simulations that Roush was going to do. Because you had to know how the tire behaved very accurately. And so they actually measured that on the car with those transducers to get the grip and how the tire behaved and at what slip angles and side G-forces it fell off. So, you know, as Greg says, we're measuring all of those things. You can measure those things. That That's, you can't do it. I, I say you can't. I don't know of a wheel force transducer that you can run uh, while you're racing. And those things were... They actually told Colin, they said, look, Colin, these things are like a quarter million dollars sensor for each wheel. If you spin out, make sure you back it into the wall, not side it into the wall and wipe (laughs) out our wheel force transducers. Right. So they're probably better now that wheel force transducers. I don't know. I'm sure they, they are, but that's getting some pretty sophisticated stuff, you know, like upright accelerations putting accelerometers on the uprights and measuring the acceleration, the vibration of the upright. Um, Again, for simulation stuff, a lot of this data they're collecting isn't to use right now by going, oh, I see on that lap, we had this problem from this sensor, we can fix it. It's to put into the simulations to allow the simulations to more accurately represent what's really happening on the racetrack. And that's where that terabytes of data are so valuable so from a from a race engineer that's going to make my car better through simulation that stuff is fantastic to make it better on the weekend or during that pit stop man we've got pretty much all we all we need i mean i'd sit there with the video and my driver before i'd sit there looking at wheel force transducer data so one of the things that i've thought about that i would like as a coach is, you know, I know like uh, basketball players, they in practice, they will wear a sleeve on their arm. And when they go to shoot, that sleeve measures the actual movement and position of their arm and elbow and wrist and everything in space, essentially. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so they can afterwards, they can look at the data and the video that's produced by that or that sort of like a wireframe model of the of the arm and go okay there's not enough extension here position the elbow i would like to do the same thing with driver like i'd love to have that on a driver's foot and ankle and calf you know i can see a brake pressure trace and that tells me a lot but it's you know you kind of come away from that and go yeah but why does the brake pressure trace look like that you know, is the driver, you know, are they releasing more with their toe or more with their ankle or more with their calf muscle? So there's some things in there that would be really, I think, I think there's another level of understanding of what the drivers could do there. A driver could also have it on their hands, wrists, arms as well to kind of see, you know, I think some of the the feel that we get in terms of is that understeer, is that oversteer? you know, we might be able to start to sense that because of just arm movement that again, we see the result in the steering angle, but we don't see what caused that result. Yep. And that's kind of what Delaro was working on back in the day was why does the driver lift off the throttle here and think he's going to crash? Right. If we can understand that, we can make the car not give him that feedback because he's lifting off the throttle way before it's really going to crash we know it's got more grip but the driver doesn't think that yeah and so yeah that would be interesting i wonder now i'm really stretching here but i wonder if all of this ai stuff that you know that's the latest buzzword ai everything (laughs) yeah you know that might be able to predict some of that if you could apply that to the driver that's 
anyway. Well, you know, that question, what where you just said about tracking feet and calves and all that kind of stuff leads me into a question for you. Yeah. It's it, it, we came from Marcellus and he said, and I think this is going to lead right into it from Greg's question. He goes, I wanted to ask about eye placement when tracking or racing a car. I'm used to tracking a Radical SR3 and I moved up to a TA2 car this year. I also do a lot of sim racing. I feel like I still need a lot of work on my eye placement. I know the rule is to look ahead. But sometimes when people tell me this, it feels very vague. I've tried working on looking as far ahead as I can because I have a bad habit of staring at the apex as I turn in. However, sometimes I feel like I look too far ahead and I miss the apex because I can't see it. So I don't understand the balance. Sometimes looking at the apex feels naturally. Exactly how far should I be looking ahead? And at what point does one stop looking at the apex to get their eyes up? And the reason that led into it is I know you've done some work tracking drivers' eyes with some special yeah. glasses. Actually, I think you might have done some of that work with Greg. And so it's all kind of coming together here. Yeah. So uh, exactly how far ahead you should you look? 87.46 feet. That's how far okay. ahead you should look. Right there. We're done. Yeah. And no. that's <laughs> in the, the Radical or the T2, TA2 car? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, in the in the T eight in the T A two car, yeah, in the Radical S R three, that's uh, it's eighty three point four six, yeah, yeah, four six. Okay, yeah, yeah, got it, yeah, got it, yeah. perfect. All right, let's oh, move on to the next question. Yeah, but <laughs> only but only on Wednesdays. On Thursdays, you, mm. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, um, so Marcel, this is a this is a fantastic question, and and you know, I spent a couple of years really really studying. Uh, vision techniques. And I read all these textbooks, textbooks about uh, vision from, you know, how the best athletes from golfers to basketball players to whatever. I read research research papers around uh, how good street drivers use their vision. And, you know, even, you know, one of the, one of the things that was really interesting that came out of a, a study I was reading was if you, a human walks down a sidewalk, and they're going to make a 90 degree turn to go turn down a side street. They turn their head uh, about half a second before their body turns. So if you're walking on a sidewalk, your head will turn about half a second and your eyes and your to track over there. And then your body follows. Well, the same thing happens when people are driving cars. Well, uh, you, you turn your head you look to where you want to go and then your body follows that. And, you know, we, we have all these phrases of, you know, your, your hands follow your eyes, all that kind of stuff. So uh, look where you want to go and you will go there. Right. So there's all that stuff, but, uh, but I agree with Marcellus is, you know, the advice of look far ahead, how much more vague can you get than that? And so I went through this study of all this, all these different techniques and I, talk to different people that have used eye tracking devices and all that kind of stuff. And I looked at videos of drivers using eye tracking devices. And, you know, one of the, the you can go on YouTube and you can find a video of Nico Hulkenberg driving a Formula One car with eye tracking device. And the first time I watched it, I went, you know, he's not looking that far ahead. But what was interesting was his eyes would kind of flick ahead and then come back a little closer into something that on the video doesn't look that far ahead. And that's part of what I started to understand in this whole thing. And I, I, I came up with this process of what the best drivers do. And there's four steps to the, to the process. The first step is actually mentally, I call it mental vision. You know, when you approach a corner, generally it's a corner that you've been through before and they haven't changed the track. It's still in the same place. So as you approach that, <laughs> the best drivers can actually see the exit of the corner before they can physically see it. It's in their mind. It's, you know, you could say it's in their memory, right? But, you know, many drivers can sit at home in a chair, close their eyes and imagine or visualize driving a lap of the track. But can you visualize the exit of the corner when you're approaching that corner at hundred miles an hour 
and you're going to break at the very last second to go down two gears to turn in and you know your hair is on fire at that point in time can you <laughs> can you have that mental picture in your mind of what the what the exit of the corner looks like and the best drivers can so that's kind of the first step so then the next step of this is we glance ahead i call it these are the phrases that i used in the in the steps we glance ahead and we glance ahead as far as we physically can see so when you ask the question of how far ahead you should look you glance ahead as far as you physically can see. And what you're doing in that glance is you're giving yourself a target and you're checking, hey, it's all clear up there. You know, there's not a car spun off the track. Um, yeah. If you've ever seen a driver who approaches a corner and you're like, uh, dude, <laughs> you know, there's a car <laughs> spun out there. You should have seen it like three seconds ago. Well, they didn't glance ahead, right? So mm -hmm. the best drivers, they glance ahead, but then mm -hmm. their eyes flick back and i use that word flick like it comes back quickly to what i'll call the focus point and that's where you focus more on the specific reference that you need whether it's where you begin braking whether it's the turn in point where it's the whether it's the apex of the corner whether it's the exit of the corner um but you're you tend to then focus more on the on the the hard references and the best drivers have more than just the turn in apex and exit of the corner they have the car lines up, that right tire goes over that seam in the pavement, you know, or that crack in the pavement or that change in the surface or whatever. Um, so, but our eyes kind of go to that focus, but then they flick back up ahead and glance ahead. And then they come back to that focus point and then they, uh, you know, flick ahead to a glance ahead again, and then back to that focus. And our eyes are kind of doing that. When people say scan with your eyes, that's the scanning. You know, we, we look quickly ahead, and what I've found in the research that I've done is it's like our eyes spend twice as much time on the focus part as we do on the glance part. So let's say, for example, you glance ahead for a second, you come back and you focus for two seconds on the on the reference point. It's probably more like, you know, three tenths of a second ahead and six tenths right. of a second back here. But <clears throat> that's the idea is we spend about twice as much time on the glance or the on, on the focus as we do on the glance. And if you find that uh -huh. Nico Hulkenberg video on YouTube and you notice that the, 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 where his eyes are going with the eye tracking device, you will notice that that's kind of the pattern that he's going through. You kind of glance the head and comes back and focus, glance the head and comes back and focus. And obviously that's moving all the way around as you go down the track. And then you rely on your peripheral vision, you know, uh, kind of talks about the, Sometimes you, you know, you look at the apex. Well, right. you can't be, you can't be looking out the side of your car as you're going past the apex going, huh, how, how am I doing? Um, that needs right. to just happen in your, in your peripheral vision that you notice, you know, yeah, I'm at the, I'm at the turning point or, you know, oh, I actually turned in two feet earlier than my usual reference point for turning in, in which case I'm going to have to make an adjustment in my driving. So you notice that with your peripheral vision, and therefore you're noticing that stuff much earlier rather than waiting till you get to the apex and going, oh, or getting to the exit of the corner and going, oops, I turned in early and now I'm driving off the edge of the track. Um, but if you pick that up with your peripheral, you can start picking, you can start making those adjustments earlier. So you go through this process of, you know, again, mental vision, then of just, you know, in your mind, you know where you're going. And then it's a glance ahead, focus, glance ahead, focus, glance ahead, focus. And all the time you pick up in your peripheral vision, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? And obviously in your peripheral vision, you're also noticing, oh, there's a little flicker of something in my right side mirror. That's a car trying to outbreak me down the inside. Or there's something yeah. in my rear view mirror. I'm, you know, I got to check behind me. Or, you know, you just notice something out of the corner of your eye and you you adapt to that. And it might even be, you know, there's a light on the dash, a warning light, an alarm, right? Um, right. So right. all of that's going on with your vision. That's what you should be doing. So, you know, and Marcellus, when he asked about, you know, switching from an SR3 to a TA2, you know, I'd say the biggest thing is a TA2 is going to get down the straightaway faster. So yeah, you want to look further ahead. But if you think about it as look as far as your head as you can physically, but then come back to, to the next focus point the next reference. Right. And right. 
keep your eyes moving back and forth in, in between those two. And because if all you do is look far ahead, you know, it's almost like you've got, um, uh, you know, your, your, uh, what's the, what's the right word? Um, your eyes have kind of locked on one distance, you know, your eyes need to be moving right. that the, you know, the, the changing the focal point of your vision. It's almost like you're taking a zoom lens on a camera, kind of zooming in, in and out. Mm-hmm. And your <clears throat> eyes need to be doing that constantly. And if right. you only ever look far ahead, that's not enough. So yeah. this is a this is a thing that it's tricky. It's tricky. It, I, it's, I mean, the, yeah, the whole checking the thing, you know, uh, checking because you want to make sure you did that corner right. But and and if you use your like you just described your focus vision for that, then you're not focusing ahead. So it's that peripheral vision to check yourself. And I guess you know, Mars. Marcellus says he does a lot of sim racing. It would seem to me you could really, really practice that fantastic in sim racing, right? And try like extremes or how fast you scan and all the things you said and try to get what works for you and your car. Is that, is that valuable? Yes. And, and, you know, having spent a lot of time in the last few years coaching using simulators, uh, there you can do that to some extent, but you've got to be very deliberate about it because the one thing about a sim, you can get kind of locked on to, I mean, most of what's happening is almost at a fixed distance in front of you. So it's easy, you know, if you're using VR, it's a little bit different. But if you're using single or triple monitors, it's kind of easy to get kind of into this fixed focal point. And because really things are almost there. So you almost have to uh, deliberately try to look through the screen and and some simulators you don't have the feedback from your peripheral because a lot of times you don't have that vr there's more of that uh but if you're using monitors less less of that and you can almost Uh start to develop some bad habits and i can tell you from experience that that some drivers will also uh i've watched drivers in a simulator who don't turn their head and the best drivers turn their head and they rotate their head and look through the corner. So sometimes you actually have to be very deliberate about practicing that on the simulator as well. So uh, a simulator can help you develop the right habits, but it can also build some bad habits if you're not aware of what you're doing. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I've you know, got to do a lot of simulator work and some drivers drive it as a game to try to get the fastest lap. And those guys aren't, really helping the car set up or anything like that they got to drive it like you drive the real world but i see what you're saying that the 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 simulator vision is kind of showing you how far you can look because you can only look as far as the as the picture the movie is is going so yeah that's yeah i would think rally drivers would be really good at that yeah because i mean they better be (laughs) i mean holy moly i mean you know, it's like you can't see the corner up over a jump and you've only seen it maybe once in your life. You know, you talked about the, 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 what did you call it? The memory mental uh, vision, vision. Or yeah. mental so, vision. I mean, you don't really have that in a rally car very much because you never saw the thing before. I mean, mostly they're going off of, I mean, they have done a recce, you know, the reconnaissance, reconnaissance run through the, through the stage where they've driven it at a slow pace mm-hmm. and their co-driver is making notes. But what they get really, really good at is the co-driver reads off some notes of, you know, flat six over 100 or whatever it is. And that driver translates that into a mental picture and Mm. immediately goes, I know what this corner looks like, even though they haven't really seen it. So that's what makes those guys so special. Yeah. Yeah, One of the many things that makes them special. Yeah. Fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Jeff, um, I'm going I'm to say, you know, Marcellus, I hope that helps give you uh, some ideas of what to work on. But um, I'm going to say that it does take some practice. And sometimes I've had drivers that start to work on this. And it's one of those cases of, you know, there's a, a slight gain, but then there's a step back. But it's one of those one step back to make three steps forward. So you kind of got to work through it. And you know, it's like if you've ever played 
had tennis lessons or golf lessons and somebody says, change your grip. At first, it feels terrible. And this could feel terrible. I'm doing in air quotes here uh, at first. <laughs> but eventually, it becomes the new habit, the new mental program. And you've got the vision skills of the very, very best drivers. So, and it makes sense. So, Jeff, makes um, sense. Can, can I take a little uh, personal moment here? Because uh, I have a personal <laughs> question for you. Uh, well, and we'll wrap up this personal, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. Then, no, that's not relationship advice or anything like that. But uh, OK, OK. Uh, 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 we'll just you know, I'm sure I understand. Quick, Oh, my watch decided to try to answer it for me. So. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so. I have an old 1969 Lotus Elan. And one of the great things about an old British sports car is, is there's always something to tinker with on it. And one of my tinkering projects lately got me to the point where I was going, there's something different in the suspension from in the rear suspension on one side than the other side. And one of the things I noticed was, um, you know, I could jack when the car is up in the air, I could jack up, compress the suspension on one side more than the other. And then I put the car on the ground or on the floor. And I noticed the ride height is different from one side to the other. And which got me to thinking, okay, these old springs, they've one of them has sagged more than the other side has. And then I started thinking, well, does that change the actual spring rate? So if a spring sags through age yeah. and I guess yes. air, yeah, yeah, constant compression and everything. Does it actually yep. change the spring rate? Uh, as we answer in a lot of these things, it all depends. Oh, good. good. Um, <clears throat> I'm fine with that. So I'll take it up. Go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that'll, that'll end this episode. Yeah. Uh, no, the, so I think one of the things that might help people understand, help you and people understand a coil spring everybody looks at a coil spring and they're like that's kind of weird how does that work and how do why is it springy and you know we've seen coil springs in our pens and our and you know all sorts of applications for coil springs on our chairs and and really all a coil spring is is a torsion bar a straight bar that we're twisting we just turned it it's a packaging exercise is all it is yeah. so we don't have to have a 10 foot bar that we're twisting to get the springing action of a coil spring we just coiled it into a took that straight torsion bar and coiled it into a coil so we can package it better and when we press down on it on a coil spring and squish it all we're doing is twisting a torsion bar so if you had a torsion bar and some people race who are racing may have had this happen with their anti-roll bars they're just torsion bars it happens in a lot of uh, old Formula Fords on their sway bars, the little sway bars. They, they take a set. They've twisted so much, especially if you do a lot of ovals and things like that. They'll take a set where they've twisted and they don't come back to neutral anymore. The arms don't come back to neutral anymore. Coil springs can do exactly the same thing because they're torsion bars. If you compress them a lot, they can take a set. And a coil spring taking a set is just shorter. It just loses some of what we call the, the free length of the spring. And it can do that for many reasons. Metallurgy, overuse, like you said, heat, you know, cheap metal, uh, cheap alloys, whatever. You've, you've, you've yielded that spring in some way. Better springs, high dollar, really good springs don't take a set because they never reach that yield point. Generally, it doesn't really change the spring rate unless you've massively overheated the thing or something, but it doesn't really change the spring rate. Because again, picture your torsion bar, your old Formula Ford torsion bar with two arms. And if it's out of, you know, if you lay it on the ground and one arm is up over the other one, so it's not neutralized anymore, it's still going to take the same amount of force to, to twist that one degree or two degrees or three degrees. Spring rate the same way. It's still going to take the same amount. You've just lost the free length. So if you have that problem and you don't have a 
car that has an adjustable spring perch so you can get your ride heights back to normal. You can always put something under the spring, a big washer and a lot of, you know, go online. Them, spring companies make all sorts of spacers to go under your spring to raise it up, lower it down, whatever you need to do. You just get the right amount of washers to put under your spring or get a new spring, obviously. But if you don't right. want to do that, you can shim it so that the, the height, then you get your ride heights back. And the spring, I would say, you know, the old 51% rule, 51% of the time, and I'll maybe even go higher and say 75, 80% of the time, the spring rate's going to be okay, even though the spring is is lost its, its free length. Okay, now I know. Now I got to go set up, uh, <clears throat> do a new uh, setup on my on my Lotus, um, which, by the way, is just <laughs> one of the most fun cars in the world to drive. So, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, I would say don't worry about that. Just go out and drive it. Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the fun part. And, and and by the way, you need to get your old Triumph Spitfire out and uh, redo it and get it streetwear. And then we can go and we can, we, we, we were joked about this is that we could, uh, we'll go on a road trip together in our old British sports cars. And every time they break down on the side of the road, we'll record another podcast. We should record right. hundreds of them. I would say a whole season's worth in one, one trip. Exactly. I mean, yeah. your, yours has Lucas ignition, right? Uh, the whole thing. It's all Lucas alternators no. and all that. No, no, all I changed no. all that. I mean, it's all been, it's got a proper uh, reduction starter and not, not an alternator, not a generator, and it's got an electronic ignition. And I know there's some people are going, oh, that's not right, you know. But guess what? Driving it is way more fun. So there's not much Lucas exactly. left. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I I did the same thing. I think my Spitfire has a MSD ignition, and it has a distributor, but there's electronics in there, and I think the starter motor still might be. Lucas, because it's the only thing that bolts in there, but you can push me if it doesn't start. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there goes another episode, Jeff. That was fun. Those were some really great. That was questions. a lot of fun. Yeah. Those are great. As, as, interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Well, let's do it again. I hope everybody gets uh racing seasons getting into full swing. I think even up in your neck of the woods, maybe the oh, snow's yeah. gone, maybe, and things are happening. So um you know, let's, uh, I hope everybody has fun and, uh, we'll do another one soon. We'll catch you on the next, uh, episode. Have fun. Have fun.